What is up, football fans? I am Danny Austin. This is the Live from the 55 podcast here from the Nation Network Studios. Live in Marta Loop, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Coming at you on a beautiful Wednesday. Uh, I have been sick the last couple of days, a little bit under the weather. So if you're um, wondering at all why I'm, you know, bloated and looking a little bit, you know, pale and exhausted because you're watching on YouTube, that's why, guys. Just, uh, yeah. St. Peter's bye week seems like it caught up to me. Just got a little bit uh, under the weather, but still, you know, fair bit going on. Lots to talk to. We have Jeff Hamilton from the Winnipeg Free Press, uh, one of my absolute favorite guests, uh, president of the Football Reporters of Canada, good friend of mine. I uh, was happy to see him when the Bombers were in town a couple of weeks ago. I think he might be the last traveling uh, CFL reporter. Uh, for a newspaper reporter. So, yeah, just happy to have Jeff. We're going to kind of talk about everything. Um, good to check in with him. Beyond that, we're just kind of going to break down the week that was around the CFL. What we're not going to do is talk about the twice annual. Is that what we call it? It's not biannual, twice annual reveal of 10 players on every team's negotiation list. It remains, it remains the most ridiculous of all of the CFL traditions. I don't know why we do it. It does us absolutely no good. Every player on those negotiation lists could be dropped from the negotiation list, and we would not know the very next day. So I think it's hilarious that we do this. I don't understand why it's done. Um, I'm hoping that somewhere out there, there are some fans, fans like you maybe, who who take something from these neg list reveals, but uh, I don't report on them, and I'm not going to talk about them. I just I, I have to laugh every time. Well, never not. It's it's one of the most ridiculous CFL things that we do. Uh, beyond that, you know, the Alouettes signed Darnell Sankey, a guy who we had here on our podcast back probably in July. Um, dude's been a star linebacker, both for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and Calgary Stampeders since he sort of arrived up in Canada prior to that COVID, that 2021 season. There's a guy who, to be honest, I was sort of wondering – Okay, when's this guy going to get picked up? Because I do think he has been one of the sort of the league's elite running backs. He's a guy who, you know, he's just a tackle machine, and that, that's a simple thing, except it, I, I just think that he's got that size and that speed, and he moves to the ball. And I think that, you know, he can he can help out with all sorts of things, but I just think that as it's getting a little cooler, having a guy like that who can just, who is such a big body, who, who has that eye for a tackle, is just going to be invaluable for a team like the Alouettes. And, uh, yeah, I like that signing. Um, I don't really know enough about the Alouettes to really know sort of where he fits in or if you're going to expect him to to be playing against the Argonauts who who lay a bit of a beating on the Alouettes. I think that like had to be a wake-up call if you're in Montreal and you know that you're probably going into Toronto in the East Final and then you, you here you are, what, a couple months earlier and the Argos in Week 14 beat you 39-10? to 10? Yeah. It's the type of thing you're going to be worried about. But, you know, I, what I one of the things I like about the Alouettes is, look, they added Sean Lemon already in the season, even though they were off to a pretty decent start. Now they're adding Darnell Sankey. That to me just speaks to a team that's still trying to get better, and a team that knows that they might not be quite where they need to be to really compete with the Torontos and, and the Winnipegs of the world. But you only need, need to beat one of those teams in one game. Well, you're going to need to win two games. But, you know, of those of those Argos and Bombers, you know, you only have to beat one of them, and that's going to be the Argos to get into the Grey Cup. And from there, anyone's got a shot. So, you know, I, I like this move, and I like Darnell Sankey. I always have. And when he sort of said, hey, I spent my time in the XFL. I wanted to give that a shot, but now I'm ready to come back to Canada. He's a guy who I think, you know, almost every team around the league must have at least, at least made a call, right? Um, Darnell Sankey is too talented a guy. He's a star. Um, yeah, so it's interesting seeing him land in Montreal. It's I think that after that 39 to 10 loss, there's just been a real I, I found at least, and maybe this is I'm on the bye week, maybe it's because I have been a little bit under the weather, but it's been a little bit quiet this week. Um, I haven't necessarily felt okay, here's a bunch of stories to emerge out of last weekend's games. And part of that is inevitably a, you know, metaphorical hangover from sort of the chaos of Labor Day. Um, and, and the follow-up, the rematches the week after Labor Day, and especially sort of with the way that sort of those games played out. Um, Winnipeg just laying such a beating on Saskatchewan. I think, you know, 51-6, to six, that, that certainly quieted things a little bit here in the Prairie Provinces, and then, you know, Toronto just doing exactly what they needed to do in that win. Um, and now we're just stuck here. It's one of the things I want to talk about with Jeff is it, it's sort of interesting that when I look at the standings, and I'm not trying to be in any way facetious here, um, 
I think we're having a great CFL year. I think how many close games have we had? It seems like every week. So regardless of how one week went, and, you know, these Stampeders and Outs was a pretty good game. I, I still think it's it's been a great season so far. Scoring's been high, you know, lots of young players emerging. It's all the things that you want in a season. The only thing is that I sort of look at it, and it's hard to see a ton of movement up and down the standings in these last two months of the year. Anything can happen. I'm not denying that. But, I mean, the Argonauts are 10-1. and one. And then I guess there's a, a sort of a fight for second between the Alouettes and Thai Cats. It's unbelievable to me. I feel like we've been talking about the Alouettes one way and the Thai Cats another. And not just me. I'm not just saying, oh, me on this podcast. But that's been, I think, the way that they those teams have been perceived is that the Thai Cats were really in that sort of bottom three or bottom four grouping around the CFL. And and instead, they've sort of survived. And they've, what, they've, won, they've won a, a couple of... The, Two, three, three, four. I'm not sure what it is. Um, I was reading that earlier, but you know, they're sticking around, and who knows what happens when Bo Levi Mitchell comes back. But you know, they've they've made do with a pretty brutal quarterbacking situation, maybe as bad as anywhere in the league. And you no, know, they're really only one game back of the Alouette. So I guess that, that there, there's possibility of some movement there. But even then, I mean, we're talking about second and third in the East, um, and, and and you kind of go beyond that. I mean, the Red Blacks, bless their hearts, um, but I don't think that they're they're making a late season surge here with with respect. They're three and nine. I think that we kind of know who they are. They've lost six in a row. You know, six games ago, I think we were debating whether they were, you know, in that upper tier or the upper half of the league. And they're just clearly not. And, you know, I would say the same thing about the Elks. And at this point, unfortunately, the Stampeders, um, I think the Elks being last place at three and 10, the Stamps four and nine, maybe there's some bragging rights there, but it's really hard to see stamps right now i mean they've played 13 games there are two wins behind the riders who have a game in hand it doesn't seem realistic to me to be honest um you have five games left are you, are you making up three games in the standings that would be a miracle so then you have kind of the bombers at 10 and 3 and the lions at 8 and 4 and i just i have so much more faith in the in the bombers particularly as we come down the stretch here and we saw them absolutely smash uh, <laughs> i'm not trying to i'm not trying to make riders the riders or their fans feel bad, but that's just the reality. I mean, that game was super lopsided this weekend. So, um, yeah, sort of, it's one of the things. I'm just kind of looking at, at the standings in general and wondering, like, okay, do we sort of know what the playoffs are going to look like already? I, I, I don't know. It's Hopefully we get some playoff races that kind of heat up here. Um, there are definitely some good games coming up. It's impossible not to look at, what, September 29th, which is Toronto at Winnipeg. That's going to be, oh, man, let's get the hype building for that. That's going to be exciting. That is one of those... Rare games where a team only teams only play once in the season. Um, obviously, a Grey Cup rematch. Obviously, it looks like a preview of the Grey Cup. Let's get the hype building. Um, I will also say I love that Three Down sort of does the, their sort of ratings recap every week. I think it's important that we sort of monitor the business side of the sport. And I, I did see, and I you know, I'm in a, in a group chat, all things CFLE, with a bunch of people, and we were kind of talking about what we thought it meant that it looked like over the weekend. Some you know the ratings were generally down across across the league um was that because it was a triple header with montreal toronto saskatchewan winnipeg calgary edmonton um was it because the nfl is back was it you know all sorts of things look i imagine it's a combination of all of them um i certainly don't think it helps that two of the three games on saturday were i mean they were fun to watch i watched i watched all of them but i can't sit here and say if you're a casual football fan and i'm trying to sell you on our league I'm not sure I'm going to say that a 39-10 Argos win over the LOS is like is, is going to do it. You know, I'm sure a lot of people turn that game off at halftime. Um, and then the Bombers Riders, I talked about it on, on Monday's podcast. I, I think that what I saw from Zach Kolaris, that was one of the most amazing quarterbacking performances I've ever seen. And I'm, I'm not joking when I say that. That first half was just surreal. Um, you know, five touchdowns passes. He was pretty much perfect. Honestly, it was in my time. I think that that's the best half of football I've seen a quarterback play in the CFL. And by my time, I mean, since 2016, but again, like it's 51, six, how many riders fans, you know, this huge TV market, how many fans across the country are, are tuning in for the second half of a game that, you know, really, it, it was, it was a blowout. There, there was only one team out there competing. So I don't know that, uh, yeah, I don't know that we can be surprised. And look, Edmonton Calgary was fun. Um, but it was a fun, interesting game. And I'm sure I don't have the ratings right in front of me, but I just don't know that, you know, it's the first weekend of the NFL. That's going to have a little bit 
of an impact. So many people spend their entire Sundays just sort of parked in front of the TV watching the NFL these days, and that's why the CFL avoids going head to head with the NFL. It's 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 a no brainer. But you know, how many people are spending two days sitting in front of their TV watching football? Do any of us have time for that? I guess in the states they do. They all watch their college football and what have you. But um, I'm just not. I'm just not too concerned about the ratings on this one. I think that ultimately. This might have been the game, the, the weekend where we had the least competitive slate of games. Um, this was not necessarily, other than Calgary Edmonton, I mean, I guess Hamilton and Ottawa, but that game was not that good. That game was not fun to watch. The score ended up being, you know, Hamilton won by a, a field goal, but if, that doesn't tell the whole story. That wasn't that great a football game. So um, I don't know, guys. Look, I look ahead. I see Toronto at Montreal. Montreal's going to want to make a statement. See, Edmonton and Saskatchewan, uh, to be honest, I thought that this slate of games was better when I started this little anecdote. Um, I was about to say, well, the ratings might not have been great last week, but look at the slate of games we had. Um, I don't know. Edmonton wants to have any hope of keeping their season alive. If you're a Calgary fan, you're, I think you're rooting for the Elks to beat the Riders here because you got to catch the Riders. So there's some intrigue there if you happen to be a fan of one of these three teams i still suspect the riders at home are gonna are gonna win this one but the elks have surprised me before particularly last weekend um winnipeg at hamilton you know this is a glamour game the last couple years obviously these teams met and the great guy sure doesn't feel the same strongly strongly suspect this is going to be an absolute massacre for the bombers but you know prove me wrong hamilton Stay in this. That'll be fun. And then Ottawa at BC. That's a long flight. I think BC is a lot better than Ottawa. I don't know, guys. This isn't nearly as good a weekend. I was so ready to, to be the hype man. Um, come in here, tell you guys how lucky we were. But you know, I'll be watching. But I don't know how. Uh, yeah, he. you have my permission to not get super excited. Because I, I can't say that I'm super excited. Other than Montreal, Toronto. Toronto, Montreal. With Montreal needing revenge. That's a fun game. I don't know, whatever. So is Edmonton, Saskatchewan. It's not like this is the worst slate of games. It's just these aren't great. Um, eh, now there's next week, really. Who cares? Guys, we got Jeff Hamilton. You'd rather listen to me talk to him than me just talk to myself. So uh, super excited to have Jeff from the Winnipeg Free, Winnipeg Free Press. We'll also just quickly thank our sponsors. Um, I was not able, because I was very sick, um, to make you know the Bills game there. But if, if you are a Buffalo Bills fan, make sure you, you, you check – out mugs pub for the games because they have a really great community of football fans who meet there um watch the bills support the bills yeah we're we're big fans of mugs pub we want to thank them as our sponsors same to fraser and fake same to you as listeners guys thanks for listening um looking forward to chatting with jeff and then being back with a little bit more energy um when i'm not as sick so thank you for listening and, and bearing with me let's get to jeff guys let's say you're having a party let's say you're having a picnic let's say you're having any occasion I gotta talk to you about Fraser and Fig. I love these guys here in Martin Loop, a couple storefronts down from our studio here. Fraser and Fig, man, these guys do these delicious elevated cheese and charcuterie boxes. You know, they're made with all these fresh artisanal ingredients, on demand grazing, pickup, delivery. You got it. Just let them know what you want. They will get it to you. Honestly, I'm such a big fan. I had a picnic a little while ago. I brought one of their curated boxes and it was a huge hit. I looked great. People loved it. We're hungry. They weren't hungry anymore. These ready-to-go boxes, they got them in four sizes. All their boxes come with meat, cheese, dried fruit, fresh fruit, nuts, olives, pickles, and carrots. Their selections vary from month to month. Choices are always new. You know, just because they've had one doesn't mean you've had them all. I love Fraser and Fig. I love having them as a sponsor. They're the best. Make sure you check them out. Tell them by from the 55 sent you. All right, Jeff, I already introduced you. How you doing, man? Really good, man. Really uh, Love being on the show, love listening to the show. So it's certainly an honor and any opportunity to talk three down football, man, between two guys that, you know, really care about the league and, and have a lot to say about it. I, uh, I look forward to every time you have me on. So good to be here, my man. Yeah, man. It's, uh, yeah, you're, you're my favorite. So it's good to have you here. Um, yeah, what I, I, we were sort of talking right before we went on air a little bit. Um, and I was like, this is the first time where I've like been like, I was feeling a little bit sick earlier in the week, so I wasn't super paying attention. And then I kind of went, and it felt like we're in a really quiet moment in the schedule. I don't know, like, the Bombers haven't – well, I guess they practiced this today because I saw mm -hmm. some tweets about how they're mostly healthy. But, like, am I crazy that it doesn't feel like – that it just went completely quiet for a couple of days? 
feels like crickets, man. And like, you know, I think maybe because of all the excitement after Labor Day and some of the, some of the storylines that came out of that, uh, you know, especially with, you know, three of those games being, or two of those games being rematches the next week, I think it was a lot of people were keeping it in, but I feel like the newsman switching over to the fall, it definitely was a quiet week. And ultimately a quiet week in the CFL is a weird week. Anyone who writes about this league knows something <laughs> wild happens. It almost feels like no news is good news for this league after some of the, you know, whether it's been the stats or whether it's been, you know, stupid plays or, or penalties, whatever. I feel like, a, I feel like the CFL was due for a quiet week after what's been a pretty busy one all season. Yeah. Cause I was looking and I was like, I don't know that this is good podcasting, but like the lead stories are, it seems to be like, on TSM, they had the whole thing about the neg list, which I'm just not going to talk about revealing. We can't, we can't spend five minutes roasting the fact that we, that we this, can do that. This neg list is in public and that this whole, you know, you know, sneak peek of 10 names. It's like, geez, thanks for the scrap CFL. It's just, uh, let's just release them. And so we know who who's coming and going because that list they send out could be changed 20, 20 minutes later. Never, never mind 24 hours later. Yeah. I mean, if we really don't know the neg list are basically like, there's a list where every team has exclusive rights to it's 40 players, right? Yes. 40 players. Yeah. 40 and they, players. They send and yeah. forever that has been completely secret. And then like five years ago, they just decided that they were going to reveal 10 players on the list twice a year, but like, there's no restrictions on that. So like literally the second that the list drops, you can just change who's on the list. It's, it's the stupidest thing that I've had. Like there's no news value to it. It doesn't help fans. Um, they don't even, I mean, I, I, this is not, I don't want to super roast, but like they don't even give you any information on the player. So it's just like, it, it, it's up I to I see it now in my inbox, Danny, and it says re CFL has released, you know, 10 players. I don't even open it. You know, I don't even open it at this point. I went through the mistake of, you know, looking into guys, researching guys, because you're right, there isn't a lot, there isn't any information, just their name and their position and where they, where they are, are went to school or are going to school um and then you're left up to to kind of google i mean the the funny thing is they used to have the names where they have some nfl players on the list and it used to create like a little bit of drama if you will it's like oh if this guy if something horrible happens to this guy <laughs> and he's forced to uh head up here to resurrect his career good news he's going to be a saskatchewan rough rider it's like yeah. at least that created some talk you know these ones i noticed a few names that were on the last list revealed for the bombers were on this list so i guess that kind of pokes holes in my idea that they just completely changed things, but it, you know, to me, it's, it's a, whatever thing. I'm actually not joking though. I, I didn't open it this year. Like I didn't, I did not. Oh, me neither. It. Same thing. Yeah. I didn't open it either. I mean, some, some, we were talking about practice and some guys were listing names off. So I was like, Oh, I remember Ian book. I think his name from Notre Dame quarterback. I'm like, I remember that name being on the bombers list either last year or the last one they revealed, but yeah, definitely uh, not wasting my time on it. I'm pretty sure the tie cats like, and they don't, I, either last year or the year before, just like seven of their 10 players were quarterbacks, which is just like blatantly making a mockery of the entire thing. So I don't think it works for anybody, but it was good to see that it was like widely ignored. I didn't see anyone paying attention to it uh, this year, but I will say that in conjunction with this news this morning that the NFL is now reserving, like expanding their practice rosters and reserving for a global player. I seemed like the fan reaction has been like, Look at all of you media idiots that doubted Randy Ambrose's global player initiative. I, I don't necessarily feel like either of us did. Um, I think that the question was either always whether that should have been where the CFL's resources were going, not whether like it had potential to be a good idea. Certainly that was my question. But it also like this is a not a good thing for the CFL, I don't think, right? Like well, you know, it is it a good thing for the CFL? I can't see a positive for them. Is it necessarily a negative? Like not really because, you know, look, I, I'm kind of with you. I can only speak for myself, but when this, you know, when this global 2.0 thing came to light a couple of years back, you know, first off with, with this, it was 2018. Right? Yeah. It was like the, at the great cup, the big signing with, you know, all these guys that were wearing would only look like, you know, you know, just stylish suits and, you know, all these men from Mexico. And it was a big sign. It was a big deal for that great cup, right? That was kind of Randy Ambrosi's big official first sign. And the theory was is that you could, you know, you could, you could find players from different parts of the world, right? Because this is at a time, and the CFL is still going through this, of course. They wanted to increase eyeballs. This idea of getting more eyeballs on them, more fans, more people watching. 
I think they felt tapped out in Canada, right? I mean, I think they felt tapped out in their markets. I mean, they were still going pretty hard at new Canadians and still are, right? I mean, that's another part of this is just people who don't know Canada. They want to be viewed as kind of Canadiana, right? So if you come to Canada, you want to cheer for the CFL. I I don't mind that approach. And so the global approach, the 2.0 approach, was to bring players in with the hopes of signing these deals, right? Because right at that time, streaming was massive, right? Streaming was huge. Um, everyone was talking about cutting cords, you know, fast forward a couple of years and, and here we are. Right. And a lot of people have, I know personally at home, I don't have cable anymore. I'm streaming everything that I need to, to, to watch for, for live sports. And so the theory was if you could start this thing and it was always going to be a slow process, nobody was suggesting that this was going to be some kind of, you know, boom right away that you know once you got guys from different parts of the country playing for the teams that all of a sudden their respective countries were going to fall you know fall in love with the cfl that was the plan over time plan over time was get more people in get a household name get a guy from whether it be germany or finland or mexico or australia whatever and then if that person could be a star in this league then they could attract eyeballs and then therefore the cfl could then sell streaming rights because streaming rights are geographical Right. It's not, you know, the zone Germany all of a sudden picks up, gives the CFL a thousand dollars a game. It's not much, but it's enough to cover something. Right. And it gets the eyeballs right at that point. I don't even think they were thinking about dollars and cents. They were just trying to get people to watch their product because you man, guys like you and me are are testament to that. I wasn't a mass. I mean, I was a I was a big CFL fan as a kid because my dad had corporate tickets and would take me to every bomber game. That's why I remember two guys, man, Alan Pitts out in Calgary because he used to just roast the bombers all the time. And Jeff Ryan and Jeff Reinbold because I was a uh, <laughs> because I was a water boy for spring camp that year. That's how much pull my dad had. So and, and anyone who knows the Reinbold years, it was pretty it was short but pretty fun. Um, not for not on the field, but off the field. And so like I think the, the like, you know, it's so like, you know, you just need to watch the game. My point is that you watch the game and the CFL is a very fun game. So that theory all worked well. I think that's where the negative comes into play, right? I think the, the NFL is now trying to do that. And I think it's going to be, I think, may, maybe not negative, but I think you're going to see that when you have a product like the NFL versus a product like the CFL, and what I mean by that is obviously just the global recognition the NFL already has, you know, now this is their plan to attack what I think the CFL is. So kudos to the CFL for the idea. You know, yeah. What, what is that? Uh, copying is the most, you know, biggest form of flattery or whatever. Imitation is the biggest form of flattery. Um, but I just think you're going to see how, when you already have that foundation, what it's going to be like to, to well, bring in some global players. I mean, if you're suddenly holding a CFL global draft every spring and you're trying to get the 30th to 40th best international talents, mm-hmm the chances of you getting a star who might actually come in and attract eyeballs from Germany, we're just using an example, is significantly lower than if you were trying to sort of draft the top, you know, the elite international players, if they exist. So like, that's where I just begin to think like, oh, there probably isn't enough talent now to fill. Here's the interesting part, Danny. Canadians are international. So are they? Is oh, that's like, the big... I'm assuming that was the talk. Maybe I'm 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 international. I like they don't say international global for the Americans because Americans make up such a large piece of the CFL. It's not the same way the other way. And I wonder if I'm assuming Canada is still counts as that's international a, to the that's NFL. A big that deal. might be an interesting one because the fact of the matter is, is I'd be curious to go to NFL practice rosters right now and see if there are any Canadians on there. It almost feels like if you're Canadian, you have to be good enough to crack the roster. Now, obviously we've seen Canadians like, you know, um, yeah. Singleton play a bit on the practice roster, but he's an everyday guy. Like you kind of need to be that guy. I wonder how many guys go, well, this guy's got a lot of promise. He's Canadian and we can stash him on our practice roster and, and you know, and, and maybe hit gold and maybe find gold here. I would say, you know, that's a positive thing in a way for the CFL, but it's hard to ignore the fact that you're taking talent away. If these guys never started at the CFL and just taking Canadians out of school. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing because, first of all, we've seen, like, I mean, there are two guys on the Los Angeles Chargers from the same Calgary high school right now, like Dean Leonard and Eamon right. Aguilar Omega. So it's like, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. as if, like, I think in the last five years, we've seen a rise in Canadian players, like, particularly position players in the NFL as is. Right. But, like, if you take, like, hypothetically, let's say there's what, 
30 odd NFL teams. Let's say that Canadians count as global and you are taking an extra 12 Canadians out of the CFL draft and having them go make more money. They're going to take NFL practice roster jobs. They'd be crazy not to. Like, we already don't have enough offensive linemen. We know it's going to be offensive linemen just practicing with NFL teams. Like, that's a, that's, a problem for the. Well, and to your earlier point, how many players has the CFL been able to find from France, from Germany, from all these countries? What's to say that the NFL is going to all of a sudden find these players and have them on a practice roster? Canada might just be the default. And 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 the crazy thing too is, is a lot of time practice roster spots don't last that long. But if you're required to have a global spot, that just gives more time for whoever's in that position to develop and to and to train. And so that. That will be an interesting situation. I'm assuming Canada's part of this. I don't see why they wouldn't be part of it. Um, but uh, but certainly something that the CFL is going to have to monitor and, and us as, as media monitor ha- paying into next season. Well, so what, like, the, I'm going off the dome here. Like, if you're Ambrosi, are you trying to negotiate to make sure Canadians are included in that or are not? Like, what's your move as, like, the commissioner? Like, what's... Ooh, ooh. I think if you're doing any moves to prevent somebody from an opportunity at, at, at a achieving, you know, the yeah. ultimate highest goal, it's not going to work in your favor and the PA won't be on, won't be, well, I mean, look at the window, look at the NFL window that came out not too long ago. Right. I mean, that was brought in because players, you know, whether, whatever, whatever sports league you're playing in and, and, you know, CFL is not as good as the NFL. It doesn't pay as much. It doesn't have the same obviously global recognition. So any, I think any attempt at trying to roadblock players, particularly from this country, to go play elsewhere and get that opportunity will not work well for Randy Ambrosi. But I'm sure he's not, he's not overly thrilled at the idea. Well, again, it's just you take 15 Canadian players, and I'm using just I'm spitballing a number here. You take 15 Canadians out of this league, the league is significantly worse. Because, I mean, there is an upper tier of Canadian talent that the entire league relies on, whether that's offensive line whether that's receivers whether that's whatever you want but you take those elite the sort of top 15 to 20 guys out that hurts the product that's for sure we've also seen it does hurt the product. there's no doubt about but we've also seen guys like guys not even crack cfl roster like game day rosters make it to nfl camps and on teams right so it's it's kind of different so to assume that you know i'm not suggesting that you are assuming that but to think that maybe you know, they take the top 15 Canadians that are, you know, that are young and, and, and killing it right now. I don't know. Maybe that's po- well, possible, but a lot of, a lot of different things with the NFL. And, yeah. and, and obviously like we're, we're saying the same thing. I just think of a guy like Zach Williams who, you know, no, he's in his probably like fourth, fifth year, but like coming out of his rookie season in Calgary played left guard was, was super, it was really good, but I had no idea that he was, let me throw Give this one at you, Danny. Brady Oliveira. Oh, he'd, he'd be crazy not to put him in. You know, I mean, if he, if he gets 1,400 rushing yards this year and five or 600 receiving yards this year, I mean, yeah. he's 26. Team couldn't, 26 he, played, yeah. he played at North Dakota. And no so injury like, history, right? Like, he's been healthy the whole oh, time. He, well, he, yeah, so he's, he's, he's got durability. He did break his ankle in 2019 on special teams. So I mean, that's he different. Missed, he missed the whole season, your... but he hasn't been hurt since then. Yeah, or hasn't I'll take a since. phone break over a uh, ligament tear For sure. any, any day of the week. Um, yeah, I mean, you being in Winnipeg, he's not going to get my MOP vote just yet, but he's like, man, he, he's clawing his way into that conversation. Absolutely, man. I mean, at this point, I mean, I wrote last week and I heard you say on your last show, I believe that, you know, it's, you know, there's a lot of great running backs in, in this league. You got one in your backyard, but this year Brady Oliveira is, is unquestionably the best running back in the CFL right now. And he seems to be taking, he seems to be taking his game to a new level, man. I mean, there, there are certain things that, you know, look, this guy is, this guy's got, all the intangibles, right? He's a hard runner. Um, you, you, well, those are tangibles. He's, but he's the intangibles. He's got the confidence. He's got the, you know, he's got the um, attitude. He's got the drive. He's got all the willingness to, to, to take it to the next level, whether that be the NFL or just continuing to dominate the CFL. 
I think it's a little premature to obviously be talking about NFL right now for this kid. But at the same time, I mean, why, why hold the limit on this guy? I mean, this season has been a special one. And when you look at, you look at the games in which he's, you know, the games he's played, I mean, he's picking up a lot of those yards when teams know the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are going to run, you know, and that's, that's, I think is one of the most impressive things. He hates the comparisons to Andrew Harris. He's got a lot of respect for Andrew Harris, went to the same high school, grew up in the same city, obviously. And now, you know, steps into his role, but he's got bigger and better things on his mind, man. I mean, he's not, he's not looking to slow down. And when you see, when you think that this guy could possibly have eight, nine, 10 more years in his career at age 26 and doing what he's doing now, it's certainly been a special, it's certainly been a special season for him. And he's been, he's been the one guy where, you know, right now, I still think a lot of people in Winnipeg are viewing Zach Claris, particularly after the last game as, as, you know, their MOP candidate, but there's no doubt in everyone's mind, he's certain. Brady Oliver is certainly the most outstanding Canadian uh, um, vote, but also if he can continue to play the way he's been playing, there's no doubt in my mind he might even he might even he might even uh, he might even leapfrog Claris as as the vote in Winnipeg. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, in terms of Canadian, I have him significantly ahead of Betts um, for for the West Division, most outstanding Canadian. A big part of that, like Betts, I mean, he's still leading the lead in sacks, but so many of those came in a pretty brief window of the season. And I just kind of feel like rewarding the consistency um, helps. But I mean, my thing with Oliver is if you're an NFL team and you're like, okay, well, we don't want to spend any draft capital on a running back. It's not a position that has a great return. Why wouldn't you take a look at him? You know, I mean, like. I if, think it's if, a good, it's a good question. You know, I, I, I don't think he's like, it, the, he's not a huge guy. I don't think you need to be a huge guy. He's built, right? I mean, I think he's. Is he he's, not? Because he looks huge. Like, I don't have his. his like, he, he's he's a huge guy in the sense that he's built. He's not a super tall guy, I guess is what I mean. Like, I think he's listed at 5'10", 5'11". I think that might be a bit generous. I interview the guy every day. I'm 5'8 on the nose. So, like, you know, whether he's got an extra inch or, or, or an inch and a half in there, whatever. But he's got the body size, man. He's got that brute violence. He's got the work ethic. He's got the commitment. I mean, you know, I, just like I would say, you know, I, I, he's, I think he'd be worth a flyer. I think he'd be worth an opportunity. We've seen lesser guys get more opportunity, whether it's just a, you know, a tryout there, workouts, whatever. We haven't, we haven't seen Brady Oliveira be associated with any of that stuff. And just given the way he's playing and, you know, the way that, the way especially that NFL are utilizing running backs now, they're not really doing, you know, the, 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 um, the workhorse, right? They're usually by committee. And if he's the kind of guy that you could bring in and chew up some yards, you know, a few times a game, I think he would be, you know, almost crazy not to, or at least give it, at least give a shot. Because as you mentioned, I don't think he would come, he wouldn't come super expensive off the bat. It might be, uh, might be just as durable as some of the other guys we've seen. Well, and that's what we always hear. Like, I mean, I don't know that we hear about it as much. Like, I mean, the CFL ultimately, like who else is talking about it on some level, but like we always hear in the NFL that, you know, anyone outside of sort of like Derrick Henry, like the, the elite of the elite running backs are pretty much interchangeable and that it's like not an area where you want to spend any money on. So again, that's my thing. I think we've seen that this guy can play. I think that like what he's doing right now, I mean, he's what, 1144 minus 829 like he's over 200 yards ahead of the next the next closest guy in terms of rushing yards and he's doing it on a team that can throw the ball too so like he was averaging 116 yards all purpose yards per game so including in the receiving game before he put up 211 yards against uh against the riders in the in the rematch so that only went up that's crazy what were they like after the riders game like what was like, I, and I mean, I, I'm asking in part because like not you, but I often hear like, oh, the bombers are just very flat. Like win or lose, they're you know about bringing your, you know, packing a lunch, getting to work, like doing all that. But like, was there any like, yeah, look at look at what we just did. So they are flat in their process, but after wins, man, they're pretty loosey goosey in the locker room. Like they're, you know, they got some adult beverages flowing, you know, particularly at home. They're not celebrating in the, you know, the, the visiting room, but particularly at home. And and that would have been the case, obviously, after this, this last beatdown of, of the Rough Riders was, I don't know. It's so much that like, even, even after the loss, man, you have guys like Brady Oliveira saying we're better than these guys. You know, we know we're better than these guys. You know, like this was a bad game. I mean, they say they, they give credit to the Rough Riders first, right? I mean, they go credit to these guys. I mean, they, 
they pulled out the win. They made more plays than us. They found a way to win in overtime. I mean, that was an impressive victory by the Rough Riders. There's no doubt about it. I don't think the Bombers played their best. Certainly didn't play their best. Still managed to put up 30 points and force an overtime and still get, you know, within a two-point convert of, of tying it. But um, definitely after, the, after that game, man, that one, make no mistake, man, that one was personal. That one was personal to Zach Kolaris. Zach Kolaris is razor focused, man. He's about the biggest competitor that you'll ever that you'll ever meet in this league. I mean, he he is brilliant when it comes to watching tape. His his IQ is through the roof. He has, um, you know, he's an ultimate leader in that he's willing to share all of his knowledge and information and time with his teammates to help them out and, and benefit them, man. But this guy takes things personally. Like he doesn't talk about taking things personally. He's pissed off all the time. He's just, that's just the way he's hardwired. And we've seen it a couple of times over, over his, over his time in Winnipeg last year, I'll bring up Nathan Rourke was stealing all the headlines, right? The line, the bombers were still winning every week. They just hadn't played BC yet, but BC was doing something super special behind, you know, a rookie, you know, like it's not quite a rookie quarterback, but my a rookie, a rookie yeah. quarterback. Yeah. Um, and Nathan Rourke. Uh, and so I just heard kind of mumblings that Zach wasn't happy and neither were the Bombers. So they quietly go about their business, but inside they're pissed off and they absolutely shit kicked the Lions when they came to Winnipeg in that yeah. first game and set the record straight. This was a very similar game. You know, when they came back, they were really quiet. I don't, you know, they certainly were not like Zach Claris was spitting fire over a headbutt, Pete Robertson headbutt. He wanted to talk about it. He wanted to take that opportunity again to, you know, use his platform to call out the league to protect quarterbacks. He's, he's been very vocal about that. But, but he was just as equally pissed off about the way the offense played. And he called the team out after the game. There was a big speech. Zach Claris does not, isn't a raw, raw guy. He's a personable guy. You have a great conversation with him, go out for beers with him. You, you know, he's, he'd want to talk about things outside of football. Um, kind of very much like Mike O'Shea in that respect. But when he, f- he felt that he needed to address the team after last, after the Labor Day Classic loss and told them that they have an opportunity to, to meet these guys again the next week. And if they didn't take full, like this was an opportunity to take full opportunity. So it was personal from Zach pretty much from the, from the final whistle after the Labor Day Classic all the way through the week of practice and surely through the game, man. Because, you know, as we saw him go six for six, you know, in the first half, have a near perfect first half uh, of football you can you can possibly have. Like, how else was it, man? My 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 lead in my game story was literally this one felt personal, and I and I have no doubt in my mind that it was. I mean, if the Riders had done their thing and been able to keep the score close, like Zach might have broken every single game CFL record. Now he wouldn't have had the ball as much, so like that doesn't fully. Mm hold together but i mean he was again it's as close to perfect as i've seen a cfl quarterback play and like i did the comparison with the dunnigan numbers and it's like i mean dunnigan's numbers in the 700 yard game are amazing he's also got two interceptions he also has about 20 incompletions like zach mm-hmm. didn't have any of that man. It was, yeah and you know what like it's i i think we were all looking we were all looking around at each other in the press box right because this comes on the this comes after four games but even before the calgary game in calgary that the bombers had just come out of the gate super slow i mean they they gave the elks a 14 point lead they played like crap against calgary even against montreal they end up winning by 20 something points or whatever but that was a really close first half and so you know, we're kind of looking at each other like, okay, I guess they were tired of here. After the second touchdown, we, you know, I kind of looked around. I tweeted, I said, I guess these guys are, you know, tired of reading their slow starts. But then the third drive happened, then the fourth drive happened, then the fifth drive happened, and then the sixth one by halftime. We're just like, I mean, why couldn't this happen on a deadline game? You know, <laughs> why couldn't this? Why can we be writing this story at halftime? You know, on a game where the game starts at seven thirty, and I need to push send by. 1035 but um but certainly i mean and the craziest thing too danny is that if kenny lawler doesn't drop that wide open touchdown it's seven in a row and it starts off the second half and who knows if that doesn't you know start to to you know whatever maybe they start chasing something or whatnot and it was so funny too lawler who was not touched in fact i forget who was on him but he he like i don't think he knew the ball was being tossed that way let lawler go and lawler just dropped a perfect pass in his mitts 
and he's looking around to the ref like where's the defensive where's the defensive pass interference that a flag that was never going to come because he didn't want to be the guy that forced the field goal after that play they went into third down and they forced a field goal but but certainly I think I think I, I, I was I was mentioning it I was saying it I was surprised that you know that that Zach stayed in the game as long as he did I mean they took him out early in the fourth quarter um which I think is the right was the right time at least to bring in drew brown but at that point i mean the game's decided you're kind of just adding insult to injury and what are you waiting for someone else to give him another headbutt that's what i thought by the end i just wanted them to leave him in because i wanted there to be history on the line like i'll be perfectly honest and like it's easier for me like it's as i watched that game i realized like if i was the beat reporter i couldn't be talking about how amazing zach like i'd have to talk about it differently because people would say like oh you just love you know if i like whether zach or it was Jake Mayer doing that. People get mad at me for saying Jake's not the only problem with the Stampeders. Um, <laughs> but like, I was like, oh, I'm just allowed to celebrate this. This is kind of awesome. Um, with the personal thing, specifically, I'm asking this because like, I look at the Bombers' remaining schedule, and obviously, the game against the Lions is like technically the biggest. Mm-hmm. But in terms of like, which one is more personal to them, that one or? the game against the Argos on the 29th. Like, all year they've had to hear that the Argos who beat them in the Grey Cup, have a better record than them, are the best team in the league. Like that, like If anything's pissing them off, it's going to be that, right? Yeah, it's a great question, man. I don't know if I have the right answer for you. Like, I, I obviously think that there's going to be... Like, have they, have they flushed the Grey Cup loss from last season? Yeah, of course. But they also haven't had to face it. They haven't had to think about it. They, you know... You know, we, we've been I've been pretty critical of the CFL and the schedule makers. And, you know, this is just a kind of another example why we're waiting this long to see a rematch of the Grey Cup. But um, so be it. But, I, you know, I I, I don't know. Like, I, I do think I think because I'd have to say the Toronto game because the Bombers kind of did get their revenge. Well, they didn't kind of they did get their revenge. They put up a 50 burger on BC after losing that game. So they kind of, you know, was if, if that would if the October game was the second and final game of the series or second of three, um, then I think maybe it'd be a little, I, I definitely know the Bombers would be up for it. They would definitely be thinking about the last time they played the Lions, but they've kind of got that back a bit. So I, I'd have to say the, I'd have to say the Argos again, I think it's, I think they will take that approach. I mean, it is in Winnipeg, I believe. So it's the one and only games and yeah, it is in Winnipeg. Um, and it is against the team they lost by a point. So, you know, they want to, and I think to your point, man, I think they definitely feel like, Toronto's getting too much love and Toronto get, deserves all the love. They're what nine and one, 10 and one right now. I mean, yep. the and Bombers they're smashing are, good teams too. And they're smashing awesome. good teams too. Exactly. And so like, you know, and the Bombers have shown hiccups. They've lost three games already this, this season. Right. And, and they've lost to Ottawa, right. In the last three minutes. So they, they've shown some, some chinks in their armor, if you will. But so I do think, I do think they'll be up for that game. I have to say the Toronto game because I, you know, much like I, I mentioned with the BC Lions kind of garnering all the all the headlines and talk and whatnot, I think they're I think the Bombers are going to want to want to make their uh, their presence known. So I, I'm really looking forward to that game. I don't know which way which way it will go. As you mentioned, I, you know, we've all, we've talked about. I think a lot of people didn't know what Chad Kelly and the Argos were going to do. Chad Kelly's the real deal. The Argos look legit. So I think it's going to set up to be a. And I think Ryan Dinwiddie's a great coach. I really do. I think he's a great X's and O's guy. I think he's got good people around him, much like Mike O'Shea did. He put good people around him. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that game uh, as, as, as much as any other this season. Yeah, I mean, because I know them all, I'll just quickly note that, like, mm-hmm. a big part of that is Corey Mace. Like, what that guy's defense has done is unbelievable. But um, I ask you, like, do you actually think, like, because, again, I look at the standings, and, and, like, you had said, well, there's a chance that the Bombers can catch. Like, you don't actually believe that, do you? Like, we basically the, BC, the Lions catching the Bombers? Uh, no, because I still think the BC Lions are, are figuring how to win and lose still. I yeah. think that the BC Lions are a solid team, uh, certainly a super talented team. Um, they have weapons in all phases that can hurt you, but I just I just have seen what I've seen from the BC Lions, and, and especially right now. I mean, they've been losing games, right? I mean, they finally got back on the win side this past weekend or whatever, but um, – or I guess two weekends, uh, but but I don't know. They you know they win a game against the Bombers, and this is I know a long time ago, but you know they're they're celebrating four days after on social media. And the only reason I know that is because a buddy of mine is works for them and happened to be a story. Right? You have Alexander Hollins, who's been terrific this season. He's been an absolute stud. Uh, you know, talking about going into your house 
and doing whatever they want. Well, they go to Toronto the next week and they get plastered. You know what I mean? Like they come back to Winnipeg and they get a 50 burger on them. You know, you have that guy and I'm not trying to pick on Hollins, but you have him setting a temp- temper tantrum at the end of a game, uh, you know, a couple, a few weeks ago. So like, I still think that because of this is where the bombers reap the benefits of their boring one and oh each week process is that they don't get too emotional. They don't get too high after wins. They don't get too low after losses. And that's going to bode well. And I, I, I certainly think it's going to be one of those. Yeah. Another year that the bombers playing the West. Yeah. Like, I don't really have any questions. I honestly, like I, I look at the standings right now, obviously no one's catching the Argos. I don't know. I can't believe that the tie cats are still hanging around. Like I really thought they were like, they were just done when they lost two quarterbacks. Like, I just think that, yeah, it's going to be, the Argos hosting the East Division Final, the Alouettes hosting the East Semifinal with the Tie Cats, and then the West will be the Bombers again, and then the Lions like hosting the West Semifinal and the Riders going in. I just don't like I, I, it. Doesn't feel like anyone's getting hot right now, and it doesn't feel like anyone's completely dropping off right now. It just sort of feels like the league is what it is, and that's not a bad thing. But as far as like playoff races go, we're a little lacking in intrigue. Although I guess the Alouettes and Tie Cats fighting for a second is something something you know it's funny though man you live this in calgary for years right like it is you want to host the playoff game obviously but you want to like the way the cfl playoffs work you host the one game to get into the gray cup you know what i mean so you so you win that division and that's why we've seen the success of the toronto toronto argonauts we've seen you know previous years we saw it we saw it ottawa right when they finished with a 500 record and and one is that you just need you know it's such an easy route to the playoffs and if you are sorry to the Grey Cup, if you win your division, that you just need to win the one game at home. And that's that's really the bread and butter of the Bombers is they've just been so dominant at home over the last few years. It's like having to go into Winnipeg, you know, in no in November uh, when it's cold. Like, and that's the thing about the Lions. The Lions, like, I don't care if these guys have played, you know, on other teams and, you know, they got a lot of continuity. That's the big thing in, in, in BC is they got a lot of continuity. They got a lot of the same guys. Uh, and therefore, you know, like, you know, they've spent a lot of time at BC place. They've spent a lot of time, you know, under the roof in BC to come to Winnipeg in the winter in November is not a fun thing to do. And so the Bombers have set themselves up nicely, uh, the last few years. I mean, they did it the hard way, you know, credit to them in 2019, but since then it's, it's kind of been, you know, easy sailing when it comes to playoffs. I mean, credit to them for being as dominant as they've been in the regular season, but that's a tough route to get through is to, through, through Winnipeg to get to the great. Uh, the stamps like openly lobbied for end of October games in Vancouver. Like they would rather have been in BC plays playing an away game towards right. the end of the were than playing in McMahon. Like they right. have, it's, it's, the but you know, they're, be- they're better battle tested. Right. And they have, you know, yeah. it's, that was, that was Calgary's, you know, dominance for all those years. Like no one want the bombers didn't want to go to Calgary in November, whether it was, you know, 2018 feels like literally yesterday to me. And I don't know if that's pandemic or that's just getting old, but like, I'm not lying. Like it feels like it was last year. Um, And like, they haven't won stamps. Haven't won a playoff game since then. Like, like how crazy is that? Well, this this is the first year, man, where I write every single year where it's like, count the, Count the stamps out at your own peril, right? This is the John Huffnagel, Dave Dickinson, Stampeders way. And this might be the first year where you could have counted them out. But what were they, 12 and 6 last season? Something like that. Yeah. That's what's crazy about it, right? Because they were the youngest team in the league last year at 12 and 6. I mean, they were supposed to take that next step this year, right? I mean, injuries have been brutal. Injuries have been brutal. Inconsistency, finding ways to shoot themselves in the foot. All those things have added up to a, you know, a four and four and nine or four and 10 record, whatever they're at. And, um, but it's weird, man. I mean, is this it? Is this like, you don't seem too confident. Oh no, I don't think they're making the playoffs. Um, I'm like, to be honest, when Saskatchewan won your guys Labor Day classic, like the, mm-hmm. the Prairie bowl or whatever we call it. I don't know. That was sort of the game where I was with Jerry Motorjong and we right. were both like pretty hyped up for the Alberta Labor Day classic. And it just took all the wind out. Because, like, again, not that I care if they make the playoffs. It really, I mean, I'm going to be doing hockey. It doesn't make a huge amount of difference to me one way or the other. But, like, it's more fun to cover your team when they're in the mix. And at that point, like, again, they need to pick up two wins and the Riders have a game in hand. So, like, like, if this is done, like, it's... there's 17 straight years, though, Danny. You know what I mean? Like, it's... And, 
Yeah. I mean, I like you've done the math. You, you like is six and six just, I mean, they got what five games left covering up, yeah. covering up. Um, so their schedule just to, just for the sake of, of bringing it up yeah. is their schedules where like they have the bombers in the last game of the year and like all things being even like that will be a win for the stamps. Cause I know what Michael Shea does and Michael Shea does not play his starters. So here's that- the thing though, about that though, man, if they, if they clinch it early, if they clinch it early, they'll sit guys in the second last game and play their players in the final game. I just don't think they're getting huh. to the second last game because that's what they did either last year or two seasons ago. Two seasons ago, I think they actually played the Calgary last game. So I think in the yeah. Calgary squeeze that they played their starters for the first half. And I think Calgary got like a one point win or something. I think um, Calgary came back and won it in the end. Yes. Right. And I, but I think in 2021 or 2020, one of the years they, they clinched it super early and I think they might've had a bye week the last week. So maybe that played into effect or whatever, but they, they, they dressed guys in their final. Maybe that was one where they pretty much booked the, the West a month in advance. So they yeah. could do whatever they wanted with that month. But no yeah, but it is an interesting point. I mean, at that, at that point, I think in this season, the way it's headed, I think you're looking at a watered down bombers team that last game for sure. Exactly. And like, you're going to rest anyone who is sore at the very least. Right. Mm-hmm. So but if you're the stamps, you have a bye week this week and then you have home against Montreal, which like, I guess most people would say that's a toss up, but like, again, the stamps just lost to the Elks when they were up by double digits in the fourth quarter. Like let's remember who the, like what, 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 ha- what is happening with this team. You can't just say like, Oh, it's the stamps at home. Then they have at Hamilton. Montreal's who, lost four games in a row though. Haven't they? Or three, yes. three four games, all with since Cody's come back. So that's so, like mean, hypo- that's hypothetically in Montreal or is in Calgary. That's in Calgary. Okay. That's a benefit. Nope. Cause doesn't Montreal, doesn't Calgary have like a curse in Montreal. Yeah, they can't win there. Ever. Right, so that's a I benefit that they're 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 at home at least. Yeah, midsummer in Montreal, it's just what could possibly be happening there. Um, and then they have at Hamilton, which like has the potential to be a really like big emotional game if Bo is back. Um, then they have home against Sask, which I don't know if you saw that Trevor Harris did a press conference today, but as far as I could tell, he just sort of said stuff's going well, and I have no updates at all. But like yeah. that's a, obviously a huge game. So if you can potentially win all three of those, it changes the tune. But then you're at BC, and then home against Winnipeg. So I guess four or five is a possibility. But like that involves playing a lot better than they've been playing. Like at some well, point, they haven't won two games in a row. So to say exactly. that they're going to reel off four out of five does seem ridiculous. But it, but they still, I'm not, you know. I still think that with those games, anyone can beat anybody. I don't think Montreal's a juggernaut by any stretch of the imagination. I do think that, you know, the Hamilton's garbage, man. So if you're not beating Hamilton, like, you don't deserve to be in the playoffs. So, like, whether it's a bow return or not, I mean. And that's a little bit how I felt coming out of the Edmonton, like, coming out of this weekend where I was like, I don't know, man. Like, how am I going to defend this team? Um, Again, I I think everyone, there were a bunch of people just talking about how that was Jake Mayer's fault. That loss was not Jake Mayer's fault. I understand people are like, just wanted to blame the quarterback, but that was not his fault that they called runs when they clearly should have been just going for first downs to finish the game off, but whatever. Um, Agreed. But yeah, I mean, so it's not impossible. So I like, but it feels pretty, it feels pretty done. At this Which point. is crazy to think for someone who, you know, for guys like us who've been covering this league, as long as we have like to have the Cal- Calgary Stampeders not in the playoffs, it's, and not, you know, and kind of not really competing for a spot this late into the season. I mean, obviously, of course, they're competing for a spot, but to not be like neck and neck with somebody or at least in not even being able to really talk about the potential of a crossover like that's I, I mean, I guess it's always there. Is that their best bet at this point is crossover like is I mean, the Ticats are a win ahead with a game in hand and the Stamps need to finish ahead of the Ticats. Mm-hmm. So Look, I agree with you. Like, I think the Thai Cats are, are are dog shit. Like, I shouldn't say that. I don't think the Thai Cats are very, are very. I had them as the worst team in the league when they lost to, uh, or is it Ottawa? Like, I just, I don't know. Those teams are all fighting for worst. But yeah. Yeah, I just, I just don't think that they're like. I, I don't understand how they're five and seven right now. Like, when they look bad, they look really, really bad. Um, and great, you beat Ottawa. I mean, again, what's going to happen to the Stamps is they're going to look back on their July and be like, how did we lose to Ottawa? How did we lose in overtime to the Riders in a game that like we very much were the better team in? And it's not going to be the losses to the Bombers. It's not going to be the losses to the Lions. It's going to be those ones. So yeah, even the one know. to the Bombers, man. I mean, that's the one that the that that 
Calgary can look at and say, we blew it. You know what I mean? Like that was a, that was a tough one to swallow. I mean, there was only one touchdown in the game and it was Demario Houston's returner in the fourth. And it was, that kind of set the tone. Calgary should have won that game, but should have, could have, would have does not, uh, unfortunately doesn't add up to points in the standings or spots in the playoffs. And I think that's where the stamps are at as a whole. Like, I think that they are a little bit like in my conversations with them over the weekend, they were a little bit just like, it doesn't matter. We're better than our record. Like this stuff just keeps happening and it's on us. And what do you do? Playoff I mean, football, middle, starting in the middle of September, man. Playoff football. <laughs> yeah. You know, like this is this is the third week of September, and it's going to be playoff football already in, in Cowtown. So at least well, you're going to – I mean, I joke I, about I, it. It's so funny how having covered those 2016 to 18 teams, and I think I said it on the podcast, like those teams would like completely just like dismiss the whole CFL season doesn't start till Labor Day thing. Like good teams, rightfully, are so far ahead that that's, that saying doesn't apply. When you're covering a team that's four and nine. Absolutely, the season doesn't start till Labor Day. Like they repeat better it. Better start. Better start sometime soon for them. <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly. that's, that's the thing for them. Absolutely. Um, well, perfect, buddy. I kept you for way longer than a half an hour. I said I was going to keep you, so I really appreciate you stopping by, man. Thank you. Yeah, man. Love what you're doing with the show. Love, uh, love that you're covering the CFL as you do, and uh, you know, really appreciate you having me on and and. Uh, and uh, toss them up ideas, man. Maybe the, the next time we talk, we'll be a little bit more heavier news stuff and we'll be able to go off on some certain things. You know, we can do that, but it is what it is. I kind of liked it, though. I kind of like, and especially with the global stuff. Like, I, I, I mean, I saw it and I just didn't really know what to what to make of it. So you, you clarified that for me. I don't know. Sometimes, like, it's nice not to just talk about idiots in Saskatchewan, right? So it's true. It's very true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to learn anything from this chat, don't headbutt. Guys, what are you doing tonight? I don't know what you're doing tonight. You're probably looking for something. Guys, you got to go check out Mike's Pub. This is probably my favorite pub in the city, 1330 15th Avenue Southwest, right in the Beltline. Honestly, they do it all. I, for years, played trivia on Wednesday nights at Mugs. It's the best trivia night in the city. Other nights, they got music. They got specials every single night. Some of the best food and drink specials in the entire city are at Mugs Pub. You want wine. You want beer. You want cocktails. They got it all. Big fan of their fish and chips. They got some amazing pizza. You want to watch the game? They got TV screens. You want to just have a drink with friends? Perfect spot to do it. You want to have some food? As I said, it's delicious. Mugs Pub. We love having them as a sponsor. We love having them just down the road from us here at our studios. Check out Mugs Pub. They're the best. All right. Thank you to Jeff Hamilton from the Winnipeg Free Press. One of my favorite people in the business, favorite people in the industry. It was great to have him stop by and talk about all things CFL. Probably not the normal sort of rhythm that we have but um i didn't i just felt like there wasn't quite as much going on around the league this these past couple days sort of between sunday and and today being wednesday dropping tomorrow on thursday i don't know why that is uh, i do think that part of it is that we had so many games early in the week and teams took a couple days off but you know great to have jeff come in sort of break down some of the you know some of those bigger bigger questions the stuff like with the global with the NFL adding that practice roster spot for global players. How is that going to affect the league? Is that going to affect Canadians? That's, I don't know. That's stuff that we're all going to have to keep an eye on. And uh, yeah, kind of nice to step away a little bit from that grind of just looking at the games from last week, looking at the games from next week. And there's no one I'd rather have than Jeff to do that with. So yeah, we're going to be back next week, guys. Just want to quickly shout out Muggs Pub. Again, if you're a Buffalo Bills fan, keep repeating this. I do think it's important. Make sure you check out Muggs. they got a great community there. And of course, Fraser and Figs, they've been here from the start love them so yeah thank you please like subscribe if you have friends looking for a cfl podcast let them know live from the 55 appreciate you guys bearing with me this week i am going to sleep and drink water and hopefully get over this cold that i am suffering through and boy am i suffering thanks for watching guys take care